Coming up next on Arizona Horizon, we'll have a debate on three separate bills targeting public employee unions. And we'll find out about a desert-friendly tree trail in Glendale. Those stories next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizon. I'm Ted Simons. Governor Brewer today released a draft of proposed legislation to expand Medicaid. The governor made her case for extending eligibility to 133 percent of the poverty level and allowing the state Medicaid director to collect hospital assessments to pay for Arizona's portion of the plan. Supporters at today's press conference emphasize that Arizona's involvement in the state and federal program is the right thing to do. Today, I'm proud to announce that we have crafted a thoughtful, conservative legislation that honors the will of the Arizona voters. What's more, this Medicaid restoration plan will bring $8 billion into our economy over the next four years. It will throw a lifeline to a safety net in rural hospitals struggling with the cost of caring for the uninsured. But there's something even more important at stake today, people. I'm talking about the tens of thousands of our fellow Arizonans who've lost jobs and their health insurance during the Great Recession. I'm talking about the thousands more who continue to work but simply don't earn enough to afford private insurance. You're on the right way of doing it when you're putting out the safety net for rural hospitals. I'm from Prescott. I, I, my hospital is Yavapai Regional. And if we don't do something to help out the rural hospitals, they're going to be closed when I need it or when anyone needs it. My name is Laura Gardulo, and I'm a 45-year-old single mother of an 11-year-old son. I was diagnosed with stage, stage 3 breast cancer on October 15, 2012. I've been a teacher in Arizona for over 17 years and have always been insured. Following my divorce, I decided to cancel my private insurance policy when it came down to choosing to pay for groceries or insurance for my son. The governor's plan to restore access coverage will save lives. It will save families, and it's the right thing to do. Opponents of the plan include the Goldwater Institute and grassroots Republican officials who don't believe that the federal government will honor its agreement to pay for most of the expansion. Well, also at the Capitol, several bills that would make changes to public unions are moving through the legislature. The three bills would impact union paycheck deductions, compensation for union activities, and the prohibiting of government contract employees to participate in a work stoppage. Joining us now is State Senator Rick Murphy. He is sponsoring the bills, and speaking in opposition is Senator Steve Gallardo. Good to see you both here. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Uh, let's start with, let's just go through these things, one, two, three. Uh, prohibiting municipalities uh, to pay for work outside the job. Why prohibit that? Well, currently, first of all, the Arizona Constitution has a gift clause that prohibits gifts of public money without compensation in return or without uh, consideration in return. And so what is happening right now is union employees, the union bosses negotiate into their contracts what so-called release time. In other words, they're released from their regular duties to do whatever for the unions. There's no tracking, there's no accountability, there's no documentation of what work they're doing. Some of it might be legitimate. Who knows what the rest of it is. They're performing whatever they're doing on behalf of a private organization, not the state taxpayers who are paying the bill. The, the uh, courts have already ruled that's unconstitutional and that is continuing to move through that process. Why should public employees be paid to do work outside of the job? First of all, what we saw so far this legislative session and in previous legislative session is an attack, an attack on workers. Instead of focusing on the priorities of the state of Arizona, we continue to push legislation that goes after hard-working employees. Right now, many of these organizations, these employee organizations, do have the ability to allow people to be on release time. Their single purpose is to make sure they settle any type of dispute between employees and supervisors. If anything, they're a big benefit to, to, to local government. There's a need for release time. Without these types of employees, uh, what you'll see are, are, are problems within offices and departments that will not be resolved. Their number one priority, resolving problems before they escalate to something even worse. What we need to do is focus on the priorities of Arizona, stop pushing these legislation that continues to die at the Arizona State Senate 
the senators have already spoken out on some of these labor bills. They do not want them. Bipartisan Republicans and Democrats have stood up and said no to them. Well, the other, the other thing that's happening, too, and, and this is in testimony from the people who are the ones negotiating the contracts, they're saying, well, it's not really costing any money because the money that pays for the release time is just part of the pot of salary money, and we're just using it for that instead of salary increases. Problem with that is this is a right-to-work state. And what they're doing is they're negotiating away pay increases that could go to non-union workers in the same category in order to segregate that as release time for the people who are in the union. Uh, there are exemptions in the bill for, say, police officers who are representing other officers when there's, you know, a, a disciplinary or, a, or an investigation or something like that. But most things are not truly work-related that they're doing. First of all, again, what, what we're dealing with are red herrings. The fact is we have members of the legislature that do not like the associations that these employees are belonging to. End of the day. They don't like them. They don't like where they stand. They don't like the issues and the candidates they support. So what do they do? They're passing legislation that's going after them at every different direction. What we need to do is focus on the priorities of Arizona. Let's stop playing fights with these uh, local uh, associations that are representing employees. Let's focus on the priorities. They continue to try to find reasons to go after them. Again, these, these particular employees that are on release time serve a valuable effort. They resolve problems before they become bigger problems. Have there been, critics will say, that unions have been abusing some of this release time? I've heard everything from naps to going out to playing golf to all points in between. Is that a valid argument? No. Again, what are these cases? I have not seen any of these reported cases. The fact is they play a valid part. They're, they're there working to, to resolve problems. You talk to any governmental agency, you talk to any, any uh, employee on, on uh, release time, they will tell you what they do. They tell you they, they serve a valid purpose, they resolve these problems. Let's focus on the priorities of Arizona. Let's stop picking fights with organized employees unions. Solution in search of a problem here? Uh, no, absolutely not. Because, see, the fact of the matter is we don't know what they're doing. Yeah, we, some of the, what they're doing may be legitimate, but there's no requirement for logs. There's no requirement for record keeping. And I suspect if we put that on the floor, that would probably fail, too, see, see, because again, the same people who say that everything they're doing is great would probably vote against again, that. Again, again, no proof that there, there's ever any wrongdoing. The fact is... You, so you'd be the, in favor the, the fact, of a log? The, the, fact is, the fact is that they're not happy with the association. They don't like the employees. Uh, they don't like the candidates and the issues that they stand for. I can't speak for. to other people's So they, ha they, haven't, they, they have no evidence of any abuse. He, he just told you. There's no evidence of abuse. So why are we <laughs> doing it? Why aren't we focusing on the priorities of Arizona? Why are we continuing to going after an association without any proof? Last point so, on this. If, if release time is negotiated by any municipalities, uh, if the municipalities yeah. don't like it, they don't have to put it into the contract, do they? The fact of the matter is a lot of these times people on these councils are re recruited and elected with a lot of help from the very unions they then negotiate with. The fact of the matter is in many of these cases nobody is standing up for the taxpayer. So I'm wondering would you be in favor of a log, of a requirement to keep a log of what they do on release time? Because if there's nothing bad going on there should be no problem with the, keeping the, the law. The, the, the fact of the matter is this is a local control issue that's negotiated by elected officials that are elected by the people in right. their particular jurisdiction. The fact of the matter is there's no proof of, of any abuse. The fact of the matter is that we have legislators who continue to want to target these employee organizations because they don't like them. Let's focus on the priorities of Arizona. Let's focus now on paycheck deductions and for third party uh, payment deductions and these sorts of things. Why should that be allowed? Why should that continue? Uh, in uh, payroll deduction, yes. it, it, again, it, it is, it is a, the right for an employee uh, within the particular jurisdiction to belong to an association. Right now, what they're doing, they're, they're selecting it. It isn't something that's mandatory. Like Rick says, we're a right-to-work state. These employees are not uh, tied down and, 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 and forced to belong to an association. I'm a dues-paying member to, to a state employee. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a right that I have. I can select that I want to be part of that organization. What's wrong with that? Why are we telling employees that they cannot belong to an association? What that's are you not, telling employees here? That's not what the bill says. The bill doesn't. Personally, I don't think that the government, the taxpayer-funded payroll structure should be taking out union dues for a private organization. But setting that aside, that's not even what the bill does. The bill doesn't even go that far. All the bill says is you have to re-up your authorization once a year. That's all it says. And the fact of the matter is, I'm a state senator. I have to re-up my authorization 
for uh, my benefits, for my health insurance, for my uh, uh, 401k, not 401k, the uh, flexible spending account for the medical. I have to re-up that every year or it stops. So why should union dues be any different than that? Why not you know, check the box every year? What's wrong with that? First of all, I have that right. I have the right to check that box. I have the right to withdraw from an employee's union. If he doesn't want to belong to an association, he doesn't have to. He doesn't have to check the box. The fact is there is a process already in place that allows me to withdraw if I decide I don't want to be part of the association. The only thing we're attempting to do here, unfortunately, is to make it harder for employees to be part of an association. That's all we're doing. Are, are workers demanding this, this, no. this particular change? No. There are Who, a lot who's of asking for it? Who's there are asking? A lot of it isn't the jurisdiction, it isn't the city, to do. it isn't the employees. Who's asking for this type of change? It's not that onerous of a thing to do. If we require it for people's health benefits, if we require it for things like flexible spending accounts, just to reaffirm that, yes, this is what I remember that my deductions are, and I want it to continue, and my circumstances haven't changed, or maybe they have, and I make a change, just to reauthorize and reaffirm that once a year is not that onerous. I, I don't see what the problem with Too much is. to ask? Again, who, who's asking for this change? Or do we, are, are our doors being beaten down by employees saying, hey, we want to have this option? No, it's a small group of legislators who are not happy with the association, so they're pushing legislation to make it harder for them to operate. The cities and towns are not asking for it. Local governments are not asking for it. Employees are not asking for it. The only ones that are asking for are a small group of uh, legislators who are not happy with the association. And one more thing you're asking for is, is the pr prohibiting a work stock, a stoppage, a strike uh, by public contract workers, correct? Right. There's a third bill, Senate Bill 1350, that would prohibit work stoppages by contracted employees who are contracted with a municipality or with the state. And the predominant area where I've seen that is bus drivers, uh, light rail uh, operators, things of that nature. Uh, the fact is, you know, we keep hearing about how this is terrible for the, uh, for the poor and for the working class and all this. The working class are the ones who primarily use that public transportation, and they're held hostage every time there's a strike or a threatened strike. And, and what is it for? They want more money from the people they're serving, and they're going to hold them hostage till they get it. These people can't even get to work when that happens local control. Again, we have jurisdictions that are elected by the people of, of the particular cities and towns and, and counties. They're elected to, to oversee and run their agencies and their cities. Why are we as legislators going into a city telling them how to run their cities? Uh, if, if there's a work stoppage, that's between the association and that elected body to, to resolve that. Again, why are we interfering into a local control issue? Again, this should be dealt with on the local level, not the state legislature. Bottom line argument I, I, I'm hearing from Senator Gallardo is that basically public employee unions don't seem to be good for much of anything from a certain vantage point. Is that a legitimate criticism from, what you, from where you're coming from? Well, I think it is. I, none of my bills have ever, and I don't expect they will ever, have anything to do with private sector unions because that's not the focus here. I believe in, you know, right to association, and if people want to associate that way, that's fine. It's the private sector, and the free market will take care of that. But the public sector is different. There are no profits. There is no sharing going on here. It's just taxpayer dollars, and frankly, there, it seems like there's always more to dip into. And when you're electing the people that you negotiate with, there's just not enough accountability there. Public employees, a different beast. Again, our, our first responders, our firefighters, our law enforcement officers, our hardworking uh, individuals, uh, there is no problem right now with, with how they are running their organizations. There's no problem right now with their, their, uh, their work or network with the local governments. Is it, we're, we're, again, we're not happy with the associations. We're not happy with the candidates that they're endorsing or the issues that they stand for, so we're going after them. We've we we got, we got to stop it right there. I, I'm not even time for a quick quote. How, about, how quick can you make it? It's one sentence. It is impossible to collectively bargain with the government. George Meany, president of the AFL-CIO in 1955, said that government unions are different. Even the founders of unions knew that. Quick response. Again, we're, there's no problem right now with our associations. Our hardworking firefighters and law enforcement officers are doing a great job. Let's keep commending them, All right, not we, hurting and, them. And we will stop it right there. Gentlemen, good to have you here. Thanks for Thank joining you. us. Thanks.
Tonight in our continuing coverage of sustainability issues, we hear about a trail of trees in Glendale. Here to tell us more about it is Joe Miller, Environmental Program Manager for the City of Glendale. Good to have you here. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank so, you. Let's talk about this trail. Where now is it located? It's at the Glendale Xeriscape Garden at the Glendale Main Library. And where is that? That's uh, 5959 West Brown. It's kind of like in the heart of, of Glendale. And so it, it coincides with the Xeriscape kind of demonstration garden and the library? Correct. Correct. It's, it, uh, we consider it a kind of a community hub. <laughs> These people come to get books and also to enjoy the garden. Now, what kind of trees do you have here on this particular trail? Well, obviously, we're going to, since we're about water conservation, we're going to demonstrate uh, different trees that are good for uh, low water use. And they were selected for that purpose? Yes, and this particular tree trail, um, our garden's been around since 1993 and um, trends in urban landscaping have kind of changed since then uh, in that we have uh, slightly smaller lots with slightly larger homes. Mm -hmm. So some of the trees, uh, we, we started uh, realizing that the trees that we were displaying may be a little bit too big for some of the urban lots. So the tree trail was developed uh, with uh, displaying small and medium-sized trees that fit our urban lots better. And, and we're taking a look right now, and, and there, there, there's information. There are little placards, little uh, stands along the trail to tell you what you're looking at and what the water needs and the whole nine yards, right? Yeah, we actually um, we surveyed homeowners at some of our classes and asked them what information did they need for proper tree care. And uh, from that information, we got an illustrator, and we illustrated five signs on proper tree care. And, and I, uh, correct me if I'm wrong now, you have the latest in irrigation technology out there, and it's something called basin-style planting, too? What's that all about? Yes, well, you know, people ask us a lot about rainwater harvesting now. And um, so we thought uh, a good opportunity once we get, we actually got a grant to put the tree trail in, and it was a water conservation grant. So. Um, Collecting rainwater was was is part of that water conservation message, and uh, so we're displaying uh, building wide but shallow basins to help water the trees. Interesting. And and now uh, is that kind of watering uh, better for the low water plants as opposed to like a sycamore or something like that? Um, well, any tree is going to. Um, what we say is the drip system will keep it alive, but if you collect water, rainwater, it'll help it thrive. There you go. <laughs> okay. How did this, you mentioned that the the garden had been there for a while? Was the was the trail always? How did all this thing get together? Well, we um, the garden had been around for a while, and we had an area that had get, gotten heavily hit by frost a few years back when we had uh, a heavy frost like we did this winter. Indeed. And so um, the, the grant became open for the Bureau of Reclamation and we thought it was a really good fit and um, it was something that people were asking us a lot about and we realized that people got the message and responded much better when we could take them out and do hands-on demonstration and then setting them in a lecture hall and, and telling them what uh, what, what, what kind of things to do with their trees. <laughs> and there are tours, right? You have tours for school kids and for, for homeowners and everyone in between, I would imagine. Definitely. Uh, we see it as a training for municipal staff, for professional landscapers, and for um, homeowners. And we love to take the kids out on, on the tours. Oh, I'm, I'm sure they love it, too. It's probably a lot of fun for them. Now, is this a long trail? Is it a difficult hike at all? Is there a, is there a mileage post somewhere? How does that work? <laughs> it's actually pretty small. Uh, but we put some um, some contours in it, so it feels like hiking out in the desert. But it's really about 10,000 square feet total. Oh, that's it. Okay, mm -hmm. so that's that's relatively manageable. Yes, yes. So if you do the whole garden, well, we have four acres, so uh, it's just one section over the entire zero scape garden. So if you're thinking of planting trees in your yard and you're thinking of going zero scaping, or you just want to know what's out there, not only how to plant them but how to water them, what's available, really, it's mm -hmm. all there. Correct. Yes, uh, it's on our signage. It's on our. Uh, we have a tree website. That, uh, the grant also uh, gave us the opportunity to develop educational materials, which included uh, a pretty extensive tree website. And what kind of response have you had so far? Oh, enthusiastic! Uh, we had a grand opening, and um, we get, we have to date had 
over 3,000 people there, and we have partnered with APS and SRP for their she shade and tree giveaways. Yes, yes. And so we've given out over 3,000 trees. Well, that's fantastic. Uh, give us uh, is there hours of operation. Is, uh, does, does the trail ever close? It's uh, sun up to sun down. Okay. And, it, and you have to pay to get to, to no, the trail? No, it's absolutely free. So bring the kids, bring, bring the dog, take a walk. <laughs> we have a lot of domestic wildlife there, too, that uh, is a favorite of the kids. Peacocks oh, and guinea hens and things like that. And the nearest parking, I guess, is what, the library? Oh, yeah. You get out of your car, and it's 10 steps away. So you can go look at a bunch of trees and go in there and do some research on them if you feel like uh, pursuing. Exactly. Well, very good. Congratulations. It sounds like quite a success and continued good fortune with it. Oh, thank you very much. On Wednesday, Arizona Horizon. More from the state capitol in our weekly legislative update with the Arizona Capital Times. And we'll look closer at the attempt to recall Maricopa County Sheriff Joe Arpaio. That's at 530 on the next Arizona Horizon. That is it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you so much for joining us. You have a great evening. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you.